Well, good morning, guys. It's always good to have you all here. I truly pray every day and throughout the week, especially throughout every Sunday morning, that God would bring in uh, people who seek to, to have fellowship with God and to find uh, recovery, help, healing. Fellowship, love, friendship, all these things. And so I continue to pray that God would, would shine that great light into this community. There, for me, there is no excuse to live in sin. It's better to confess our sins and, and to admit that we're never going to be fulfilled in life so long as we have no love for our communities and our neighbors. And, and I recognize and understand that you know, this community, along with half of the United States of America, all believe the Savior is Donald Trump. And, and here in, in a few months, our Savior is going to deliver us all from the problems that we're dealing with, but He will never come to this community. You'll never see Him. You'll never see any of His power, His love, His grace, anything coming to this community. So the only thing going to make this community a better place is us who live here. And if we can't find within ourselves a sense of compassion, empathy, and love for the people who live here to be that good neighbor, to be friendly and kind, then the neighborhood will never be a nice, friendly, kind neighborhood. And uh, so in that, we're, we're looking throughout all week, step 10, of self-control. And how we find in self-control contentment. And our contentment comes from God in our presence. And, and, and it's not just a, a sense of self-control over the influence of a foreign spirit, which is, you know, as we've seen and heard and, and we'll talk about, you know, there's the man who was being possessed and tortured and tormented by an entire legion of demons. As he was walking around um, in, in the tombs, and around the tombs at, at the graveyard, hurting himself, cutting himself with stones, and attacking anyone who came into the, the graveyard. <clears throat> He's under the influence of a foreign spirit, a, a demonic spirit, an evil spirit, and, and that is where his torment came from. And in that, he had no ability to display a sense of self-control. And we're talking a lot sometimes that the self-control of an emotion or a feeling, such as anger, depression, whatever it is, you know, uh, if we can control over our emotions and, and our spirit and the things going on inside of us, then we have the ability to control over the things outside of us. And, you know, uh, addiction is addiction. All different forms of addiction. There's the addiction of hoarding, addiction to food, sugar, soda pops, uh, video games, television, alcohol, drugs, whatever it may be, that they're all the signs of, that we have been affected and we're living under the effects of being abused somewhere in life, whether as a child, an adult, or exposed to some sort of a traumatic event. The side effects are all the same, and, and no matter what the addiction is, it's all the same. An alcoholic is no worse than a hoarder, and alcoholism doesn't hurt anybody other than the person drinking it. 
the beer and, and stuck in that. Hoarding doesn't hurt anybody except for the person living in, in a house full of garbage and, and trash. Same with food. It doesn't hurt anybody other than the 600, 500, 300 pounder. And so in all of it, as I have said throughout all my life, I have struggled with self-control. That's why it's step 10. It's way down the list. We don't start with self-control because in gaining self-control, we need God. And so we got to get right with ourselves and right with God before we can even have God come in and take control over us. So it's a matter of willpower and surrendering our willpower to the willpower of God. And then he rewards us with that sense of self-control. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Does anybody have any prayer requests before we begin? Any thoughts or, or concerns? Uh, I know we will and always going to continue to pray for Grant uh, and for his family, Dorothy, and all those who have been left behind as he was a great pillar not only within his community, but of his family. Everyone depended on Grant. He, and, and I think a lot of it was because Grant displayed a lot of good character. You know, he, he was a good guy. And he did a lot of good things. Things that, you, 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 you know, he was the guy that believed he was the truth. And so he didn't need to go to church so much because he was just going to do the things Jesus asked him to do. He was the guy that would go down and visit the homeless and, and hang out with them simply to be their friend. And, and he was that kind of a guy. And, and with that, people respected him. And they respected him because uh, of the way he lived his life. And so that's what we're coming to see in all of this. It's about the way of life, the way we live. So we'll continue praying for them. It's a great loss to their family and community. Continue to pray for April Marie lives down in Texas and, and she's always struggling with all kinds of body ailments and, and the struggles of, you know, being a semi-crippled person. And she's not fully crippled. She's got the strength of God. But she needs prayers. She suffers from pain issues and things. Uh, we'll continue to pray for Katie. Katie Cecina and, and, and those in her world. I, I know she lives down in Florida and in that she doesn't have the support of a family of any way or of any kind and, and even though she reaches out and tries to find support from her brothers and that they they will i believe have the ability to financially help her from time to time but that emotional support that that support when you're feeling alone and, and left behind <clears throat> some, sometimes so much greater than that of a financial need. So we'll continue to pray for her. We'll continue to pray for Davina and, and Travis and, and their life and situations and things they struggle with. I think today is a great message for them, for all of us, for myself. <clears throat> As I say, self-control is mastering over ourselves. It is the hardest thing in life. And, and <clears throat> this is a thing that goes on all throughout life. It's not just something we click on and, and then bam, we got self-control. And we're good to go. It's a daily struggle. It's a daily fight. The flesh and the desires of the flesh are always warring against the spirit and the desires of the spirit. And, and that's the struggle, our fight. Is it against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the rulers 
of this dark world and those inside of the heavenly places, meaning demons and devils and things of that nature, the things that tempt us from not believing in God or trying to pull us away from the goodness of God. So let us begin with a little prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all the wonderful things you're doing in our lives, even those wonderful things we cannot see or do not know about. We know all good things are flowing from you and through you into our lives. So every good thing we give thanks for. We give you thanks, Father, for the food we eat, the water we drink. We thank you, Father, for the air we breathe because we know it is your life. We thank you, Father, for all the good people you surround us with, no matter where we are. We thank you for the family of Grant and all those good people who are there to surround him in his time of need. And even though we know he's there with you, remind us and strengthen our hearts to, to recognize your love for him as you welcome him into your celestial kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for all your love and your grace. Continue to move through us, helping us and building us up as we can walk through this life. In Jesus' name, Amen. Could you turn that cheater off? Because that doesn't hit it's loud. We got a little music. Let's listen to this music real quick. Cool. Oh. 
So as always, we welcome God into this place. Half that song is Hebrew, the other half is English. Just tell me what they said in Hebrew. Welcome, Spirit of God. You're welcome in this place, as always. So self-control, let's look a little bit through some of these definitions that we have here because uh, I just think it really helps define what we're talking about. Self-control is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Evidence God is present in our lives. And I think that's what we're learning through not only the 12 steps, but in the Bible. We need God in our life. And, and we don't just need to believe in God or to have faith in God. We need God in our presence. And when God is in our presence, mighty things can happen in our lives. So self-control is the ability not to show your feelings or not to or not do the things that your feelings make you want to do. Troubles with self-control isn't always just a matter of catching up. It can be a sign of frustration and anxiety that comes with struggling in school. And granted we're all grown adults and not in school, but with that being said, we're students of Jesus Christ. That's what a disciple is. It is a student of the way. Those, this way of life, and, and Christ provides for us that way of life. So sometimes we find ourselves struggling, we find ourselves frustrated and full of anxiety because of our, the learning process or the way Self-control is never an easy topic to talk about. It's usually the one thing everybody gets upset over. Everybody wants to believe and, and I'm forgiven. And, and I'm not saying forgiveness isn't the power of God's love. We're not talking about that. Yes, we, we have forgiveness. And if we faithfully confess our sins, God Jesus will cleanse us of all unrighteousness and forgive us of those sins. We always have Jesus as an advocate, as an atonement for our sins. We can always come to God and start over fresh, and, and we can do that all the time. But that being said, Jesus Christ never came into the world to, to empower us to sin without guilt or shame, to, to live in sin. And, and, you know, it's not about me displaying a sense of my own righteousness or virtue. In, in order to gain salvation, this is evidence God is in my presence. And, and, and when we are a spirit-filled person, there's evidence. There's evidence. There is a transformation of our lives, and it cannot be denied. And that's how it should be. And that's why Jesus said we must be reborn to be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. We must be reborn. Putting off the works of the flesh and putting on Christ. Jesus is going to reconfirm really all these things that I'm speaking of today. He never came into the world to abolish the law but to enforce it. Because in enforcing the law, and when we say the law, the Torah, the first five books of Moses, in enforcing it, it shows our need for God in our presence. And that's what God was dealing with there in, in the time of Exodus, in, in the time of Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and, and all the folks we find there in the books of Genesis and Deuteronomy and Leviticus, Exodus, Numbers, the need for God in their presence. And as the people kept fighting and arguing, you know, do we really need God in our presence? Can't we just go back to Egypt? Can't we just go back 
to our old way of life, and, and even that, you know, without God in their presence, they weren't even able to go in to the promised land. So we need God. It goes on to say, with the Holy Spirit inside of us, we are able to possess self-control and demonstrate the fruits of the Spirit. We can live in a way that is honorable to God. The ability to regulate or our impulses and desires is indispensable to success in living in working with other people <clears throat> with good control over their thoughts and processes and emotions and behaviors not only flourish in school and in their jobs but are also healthier wealthier and more popular when why popularity well when you have a sense of self-control you're less agitated you're less angry people like to be around you they enjoy your company. It allows people to direct their attention despite the presence of competing stimuli and it underlies all kinds of achievements from school to the workplace. It benefits relationships as well. So you want to be a part of, of a strong healthy relationship, you got to recognize where does the toxicity come from. And, and toxicity or being inside of a toxic relationship either is one or two of the members in the relationship have no self-control. And because they have no control over anger, their emotions, frustrations, anxieties, or disappointments, it creates for a toxic relationship. Where there is self-control, there is the presence of God. And where there is the presence of God, there is order. Order. Self-control is a sense of order. It's not chaos, but that of order. I love this part of the definition. Uh, my friend gave me this, and I think it really fits exactly what we're talking about. A true sense of self-control is giving up your right to be controlled by your emotions and choosing as an act of your will to submit to God and give it over to Him for Him to deal with as He sees fit. So then, gaining a, a sense of self-control we're going to give up control, we're going to give up our desires, and we're going to surrender to the willpower and the power of God, and then God rewards us with a sense of self-control. Some of the times we're, we're struggling and we're out there having problems with our emotions, our feelings, our frustrations, our anxiety, is uh, things aren't going my way. And, and, I, and I'm trying to either establish my own virtue, my own righteousness. People don't agree with it. We're being rejected. We're being despised, whatever it may be. And, and we become frustrated with it as I'm trying to establish my own thing, my own glory, my own fame, whatever it is. And so we're not content. We're restless. And, and we're agitated. And sometimes we lash out at people because they're not seeing it exactly our way or the way we think they should be seeing it. And so a lot of, you know, all of our problems, right, is coming from you. <laughs> it's coming from you. This is my problem. It is everything you're doing. And, and, and yet, you know, it's always wonderful when it's everybody else's problem. But when we're talking about self-control, that, that's, that's erasing everybody else and making ourselves the focus of, of whatever it is that we're dealing with. Maybe ourself is the problem. Maybe it's ourself that is to blame. And, and we'll find that contentment 
when we surrender to God and having God in our presence. And, that's, and, and when we say we're, we're content, one of the things that, that makes us feel content or seals our contentment is recognizing and understanding I'm enough. I'm good enough. Right now, I'm enough. I'm good enough. And, and, and whether you validate me or you don't validate me, it, whether you see my worth or my value, it doesn't matter because I'm enough. And I'm enough in, in the eyes of God. And God has validated me. And how does God validate us? He validates us by being in our presence. And in being in our presence, God produces the fruit. God produces the fruit through us, a sense of gentleness and kindness and love and respect for others, empathy, sympathy, compassion. All these things represent God's spirit alive in us and in our presence. And that's usually what's going to create for us a, a good, healthy sense of relationships. When you have the ability to do unto others as you have them do to you. When you display a sense of patience. You know, we talked in step nine was about the baptism of the Holy Spirit coming into us and us being spiritually good. And the spiritual goodness that displays from us is not a virtue or a righteousness of ourselves or something for our own gain, but it, it's a display of giving away good to somebody else because that somebody else matters. And it's good. And so all of that and all of these things, we need step one, faith, all the way down through step nine, and then step ten just begins molding it together, it begins binding it all together, and in that we find a little bit of self-control. And we need all of this, and in all of it, what have we all started with? We started with faith, faith in Jesus Christ, faith in his love and his his ability to deliver us from out of a bad situation. It restores our ability to trust in God. And all of it, we're bringing God into our presence. We're manifesting God in our world. And it comes through us. God wanting to work through us and with us. A great story and a great example is the man who was possessed by a legion of demons, Jesus, and then crossed over the sea, and, and they come to this place, and, and immediately are confronted with this man who is naked. The locals of you know, the town would chain him up and, and try and, and control him, right? Because he has no self-control. He'd break free from those chains and he would torment anybody who came into the cemetery or the tombs or the graves because this is a place of absolute frustration and anger and upsetness. And he's cutting himself. He's cutting himself. That takes me back all the way to the time of Elijah and there's Elijah. And he's dealing with the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Jezebel. A false god, and for that they create for themselves an image known as Baal, and, and it is the a god they approved of instead of the god that is, and, and it's idolatry. And so Elijah says to the Lord, they've killed all of your prophets, and I'm the last one. And, and there are no more real prophets in the world. There's nobody preaching the gospel. There's nobody dedicated to the Torah and the laws. And Oh, Lord God, they've all gone their own way. And in that they murder and they kill. And they kill the people who want to preach your word in truth. Help me. Right? Be my word. Be my God. And so Elijah presents to the people who are worshiping Baal. And there's 150 of them, right? And there's one of him. All right, all you guys, we're going to have a contest. We're going to put the rubber to the road. Whose God is God? The God you approve of or the God that is? 
Then have a sacrifice. You guys have your bull. There's your altar. You sacrifice it. Do whatever you got to do. Call upon your God. And if your God is God, it's going to answer with fire and burn up the sacrifice. I will worship your God. Now, I'm going to do my thing and I'm going to divide up this bull, I get my own bull, and I, I got my own altar and all this stuff, and Elijah is very careful to follow all the ways of the Torah and everything in there, and divides the animal into 12 pieces, one piece for all the tribes of Israel, and he sets everything all perfectly in control and all that, and, and even douses it with three buckets of water, and so much water, he even digs a trench around it so the water can't escape it's fully soaked there's no denying that God lit the spark that burned up that sacrifice so they begin to cry out and they're doing their dancing and they're hooping and they're hollering noon comes along and no God no answer no nothing Elijah begins to mock them. Where's God? Where's your God? I, I know, I got it. He's went on vacation. But when he returns from vacation, maybe then he will answer you. And they're going on. Oh, I know where your God is. He's over there creating a, a new galaxy or a new place. He don't got time for you guys, right? But when he finishes, maybe he will answer you. So he's mocking them. And the people begin to be frustrated and upset. And then they begin to cut themselves. This is the same thing the Native Americans used to do. And, and what they would do, and, and these are different religions all over the world, and what they would do was, okay, because my God loves me, because my God cares about me, when my God sees my blood, when my God sees my pain and my suffering, he will then respond. Ah, he wouldn't respond to these prayers. He wouldn't respond to my dancing. Wouldn't respond to my, my speaking in tongues or whatever it may be. But I know when he sees my blood, when he sees my suffering, he will then answer. So they begin to cut themselves. And then they're bleeding and all this stuff. And, and again, no God answers. And so Elijah and one command, if you are the Lord my God, answer by fire. And fire immediately falls from the heavens and consumes the sacrifice. And for that reason, John the Baptist was known as the Elijah who was prophesied about. And that's why he baptized in water, it was to manifest the Holy Spirit. And his message always was, believe in the one who comes after me, because the one who comes after me is going to come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit, with power, with fire. And Jesus is that guy. Here you got a man possessed by demons, walking amongst the tombs. And I could imagine the demons that were tormenting him and the legion of them it is all the dead people in those tombs that he had known. You got to remember that Rome would come in and, and they would bring their legion and the legion is like a thousand uh, troops of a little brigade of an army and, and they would come in and if anybody stood in the way of Rome they were killed. They went in, and one great example is that of uh, Corinth. So in the time when Paul met the Corinthians, they're Romans. There are no Greek people there because the original Greek Corinth people challenged Rome, and Rome killed them all. They wiped them all out. And they would chase them for 100 miles to make sure they killed the last man. Never to have a rise back up against them. All were dead. And so I imagine these people all came at the death of the Legion. <laughs> and it's his friends. There's my dad, and here's my mom. And, oh, there's my brother and my other brother. And, oh, there's my best friend. There, there's my, the whole class of, of, you know, 
my high school and all of that. He's in his main, main community. And so he, he's struggling and, and is frustrated and, and full of anxiety. Where is God? Where were you, God? These people are, are Jewish people. They are Israelites. They, these are the people you said you so loved and protect. Where is God? So angry, so frustrated, has no self-control. Because where there is no God, you find all these things. Envy, strife, jealousy, anger, frustration, anxiety. It's all right there. Because God is missing. God is absent. I have no self-control. That's the one place the devil uses in our lives is when he sees, okay, you do not have the ability to display a sense of self-control. Perfect. Now I can step right in and grab a foothold right into your life. Why? God is missing. And I can see God is missing. And I know God isn't with you. Because the fruits of God's presence is a sense of self-control. So now I have an opportunity. And I get there in your life and the devil comes to torment you. To torment you and to remind you always, right? You don't have no God. I am your God. And the devil and the best the devil can produce is death. Death is your God. Death is your future. Death is the end. What's the point of life? What's the point in, in being married? What's the point in having children? What's, what's the point in continuing to, to desire to be even a good person in life when in the end, I'm just going to die. In the end, we'll become ashes and dust and nothing. We'll be blown away like the chaff in the wind. What's the point? I can see the man's frustration. I can see the man's anger. And there, here's Jesus. He doesn't come by accident. He comes to say, Oh, I heard your prayer. I saw your suffering. I, I recognize and understand you, you've been cutting yourself. And, 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 and so here I am. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Where is my God? Where is God? And here he was, standing there in the presence of the man, and, and the man begins to stay away from me. And, and, and he was telling the unclean spirits to come out of the man. Come out of that man. Unclean spirits. And what was making the man unclean? His inability to believe God loved him. His inability to believe that it was God who desired to validate him and to restore his word. His inability to believe that God would dare come and live and be in his presence. And that came from the influence of this foreign spirit that was tormenting him. The torment was, I won't allow you to believe that God would dare come into your presence. Jesus tells them, get out of him, you unclean spirits. And the unclean spirits begin to argue with Jesus, begging Jesus for relief. Don't destroy us, right? And what can Jesus do? Nothing but deliver. Jesus is salvation. He is the salvation of God. And, and, and that's what he does. That's what he is. When he says to Moses, I am what I am. I am that I am. And then Jesus says, I am salvation. That's what I am. That's what I do. I deliver. I help. I rebuild. I restore. I redeem. I do not destroy. I do not kill. I do not condemn. Can't do it. That's the work of the devil. So the demons beg him for deliverance, and he allows them deliverance. They chose. Let me go into the pigs. That's what we desire. I don't want to go into the fiery pits of hell. No, send us into the pigs. And the pigs ran off the road and went down and flew off the cliff into the water and drowned themselves. They were not salvation. There is no salvation in the pigs. 
And so they entered into a place where there was no salvation. I am salvation, says the Lord. And then all of a sudden, that man is in his right mind. And they clothed him. And he was at peace. And he had contentment. Because he was in the presence of God. He was in, 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 in the presence of salvation, deliverance, redemption. He had contentment. God answered him. God showed up. I want to go anywhere and everywhere you go, Jesus. Well, if you want to do what I, anything I, I, I desire, why don't you go back and, and tell the people about what the Lord has done for you? Because all the people were so afraid. They heard what had happened. They came out. They, they heard about the pigs and saw obviously all the dead pigs floating around in, in the water. They were afraid. Jesus, get away from us. We don't know you. We don't know where you came from. Stay away from us. And so Jesus says to the man, no, you, you go and, and tell these people what the Lord has done for you. Share with your community, your friends. And, the, and, the, and, and so they went. He went and told the people what Jesus did for them. Again, it's confirmation that when Jesus says, do you go tell them what the Lord your God did? And he responds by saying, this is what Jesus did. Because he's the Lord my God. He's the one who showed up in the midst of the fire and delivered me. And the deliverance came from self-control. He went back to the people and they were amazed. They could see the transformation of his life. And the transformation was, he was walking around in a sound mind, with the right mind thinking, fully clothed and dressed with a sense of self-control. They no longer had a need to tie him up or bind him up or chain him up or any of these things. There was an absolute transformation of his life. That transformation came from Jesus in his presence. The one thing they could not deny. You've been in the presence of Jesus. You've met God. We can't exhibit a sense of self-control absence of God. I can't. None of us can. Because self-control is the fruit of God's Spirit. And when we're a Spirit-filled person, we'll be able to protect the spirits of God. God being present in our lives. And I recognize and I understand a lot of people don't want to hear that. Oh, no, no, you're, you're preaching works. James clearly says, without works, your faith is dead. It's void. It has no value. The works is God in your presence. That's the works. And I will show you my faith, and I'll show you my faith is alive through the works I do. Evidence, God is with me. And James says the hardest thing to control is the tongue. The tongue of a human being. We can go out and we can tame the elephants. We can tame horses. We can tame any and every animal. The whale, the dolphin, whatever it is. Chickens, birds, we can tame it. And it's all at the control of whatever we want. We can tell it what to do, and it will do it. But we cannot tame the tongue. We have no control over our tongue. And the tongue is a fire. And just with a little spark, an entire forest fire happens. It doesn't take much. Even as a boat, a ship, it has a little tiny rudder and a big giant boat and, and it could be directed anywhere it goes. The horse, you put a bit in its mouth. Horse has free will, it's far more powerful than its rider. But when it's been trained and has that bit, the rider can direct it anywhere it so wants to go. 
Does the horse, do any of these animals, do any of these things have free will? They certainly have free will. But they surrender to the willpower of that which is controlling over them. And that's where it is. We're, we're going to surrender to the power of God. And that's what James is trying to say. You need God. You need God here in your life. And what you need to do is surrender to his will, to his power. And he will reward you with self-control. He will control over your tongue. We can't control over it. But God can control over it. Our tongue, right? When we have a thought bubbling around in our mind, my tongue, my voice says, I can't do it. I can't do that. So I'm not even going to try. And you'll never be able to do whatever it is you think you can't do because the tongue, the word, is directing the step. In the same way the horse is being directed. And the tongue is directing the whole ship, the whole body. I cannot be like Jesus Christ. Of course, and you never will be. But the Bible says all things are possible through those who are strengthened by Jesus Christ. Nothing is impossible. Jesus says, I have appointed you to produce fruit. Jesus says, this is what you can do. Things, everything I can do, and more mightier things than that. You can do it. You can be just like Jesus. But you can't say, I can't. That's where we're going to find self-control. Every time that word, I can't, starts bubbling around, and before it comes out my mouth, I'm going to grab hold of it and put an end to it, because I can't is the devil trying to speak through us. You can't be like Jesus. Don't even try I won't. There's that word. I won't. The devil is, is the master of I can't, I won't, I don't. And before those words come out of our mouth, we got to grab hold of I won't. I won't succeed. I won't be good. I won't do this. I won't do that. That's the devil. Grab hold of it and there's that sounds that, that sense of self-control. I'm going to control over that. I'm going to control over the mouth. And the words I say, I'm going to speak life over me. I can do all things when Christ is strengthening me. I can do all things when God is in my presence. Even display a sense of self-control. There's nothing impossible for those who believe. God is a rewarder of them. The words of faith. I don't. I don't matter. I'm not important. I can't be used by God. The world, the, the neighborhood, my community, our family, whatever it is, it doesn't need me. It's functioning just fine without me. Again, that, that's coming from the devil. It's coming from a false god. The God who seeks our destruction to break us down, to tear us down, to prevent us from being the good neighbors we know we ought to be. We're going to grab hold of those words and we're not even going to let them come out of us longer. I grew up construction. I had no problem with the F word. Never saw any problems with the F word or cussing. Cursing and cussing are different. But just the, the word and the F word and it was being very destructive. It's a word of death. I never saw it that way. I saw it was just my language. It was just how I talk. But I, I really tried to control over that. That's a, a good place to start when we're implementing self-control is I don't even allow these words of death and, and destruction and, and anger and hatred to even flow out of me. So when I hear it and I feel it rumbling around in my mind, I'm going to grab hold of it and I'm not going to allow it out. I'm going to speak life. I'm going to be like Jesus. I'm going to speak life. Even when, when Jesus was there and he frees the man from the demons and the people were rejecting them, the good John and faithful James says, Lord, let us pray to God 
that he would rain down fireballs and destroy them. Man, I'm pretty proud of that. You know? Jesus immediately rebukes them. Hey, sons of thunder, that's where they get their names, the sons of thunder. Hey, enough with that stuff. I'm here that they might be saved. I don't come here to destroy or condemn anyone or to hurt anyone. I'm here that they might be saved. See, Jesus isn't the God who needs our approval. He's the God that is. So many of us in our, in our lives is, oh, and this is what divides us. I only approve of this God, the God being taught in this church or at this place. Instead of believing in the God that is. And the God that is, is the God that gathers us together as believers, no matter where we go to church, no matter where we are in the world, to display a sense of light in a world filled with darkness. Donald Trump isn't the savior we need. The savior we need is sitting right here. Donald Trump is never going to go out and visit the homeless while they're in the midst of, of their distress. But we have the power to do that. We have the ability to do that. Do we want to? Do we believe God can do a mighty thing through us and with us? I want to read to you a few words from Jesus himself as we go to Matthew chapter 5 and he's speaking there at the Sermon of the Mount and we'll start right here with verse 13. You are the salt of the earth but if the salt has lost its taste how shall its saltiness be restored? And yes, we, we preach truth and me being a, as a preacher, you know, I'm not going to not speak about the truth and, and the truth behind some of the things that are going on. Now, when we speak of cussing or using bad words and words of death, and, and usually those words bring death to ourselves and not the people around us, when we're speaking of a curse and cursing others, and we say this because James says it should not be that the same mouth that says we are blessed, we are all made in the image of God, then goes out and participates in the works of gossip and slander for the purpose of tearing down another per person's reputation so, so that they are, are destroyed. Their testimony is destroyed. Their person is destroyed. So nobody will trust them or nobody will listen to them. That's a curse. Tearing somebody down to the point that they have no value at all in life. And that's something Jezebel was a worker of. Slander and gossip. And tearing down other people's reputations only for the sake of destroying that person. I have no desire at all to destroy anybody in the community of Ray or Yuma, Colorado. What I want is you to see the truth and the truth behind the actions you do because I desire to live in the community that's full of kindness and love and generosity. I want to feel safe when I go to the grocery store. I want to feel safe when I let my children run around up and down the streets. And how will I know I'm in a safe place? Because I can see and recognize the presence of God shining forth from the members of the community through the production of God's fruits. The presence of the Holy Spirit. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others 
so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is heaven. So, again, Jesus isn't saying we're going to abolish good works. We're, we're, we're going to abolish the law. Jesus is saying they will glorify God and God in their presence, God in this world, when you produce the fruits of God's glory. And they will honor God. And they will praise God. In the same way, the man suffering from the torment of the legion of demons. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Law has purpose. There's a purpose, and when you say law, it's the Torah, the first five books of Moses, Genesis, and Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. All of that has a purpose. And the purpose is to show your need for God. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't do it without God. You can't do it without the helper. The helper, the presence of God shown to us through the Holy Spirit. You have heard it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Now Jesus begins to say, let me tell you how important self-control is. He's speaking about self-control. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Self-control starts within your spirit. It's not the, the words or the things that, that come forth from you. It's the words and the things that are bubbling around inside of you. You don't have to kill somebody in order to, to murder them. All you have to do is simply hate them from your heart. And you've already murdered them. Therefore, oh, excuse me. But I say to you, everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift. Therefore, in leave your gift there before the altar and go first be reconciled with your brother. And then come and offer your gift. Again, he, he's talking about controlling over your emotions, your feelings. You, you, you'll need the presence of God with you if you're going to come and bring your gift to the altar. God is love. God is love. God is not a, a spirit of hate or anger. God is not a spirit of frustration or anxiety. Those are signs that God is absent. Because when God is present, we have contentment. With contentment comes the release of anxiety and frustration. He goes on to say, Come to 
terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court. At least your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And a lot of people say, well, you know what Jesus is doing? He's raising the bar. He's raising the bar so that nobody can measure up. Well, you know what? I used to think that. You know why I used to think that? I didn't know what the Bible said. I didn't know what the Ten Commandments were. Thou shalt not covenant your neighbor, your neighbor's things, or his wife. He doesn't raise the bar. He's confirming that these commandments are from God. And the reason we say he's raising the bar is because I didn't know what the commandments were. I couldn't understand them. And the commandments are, are set in place as a demonstration of self-control. So Paul says, everyone who obeys the commandments has God in their presence. Because it takes God in your presence to be able to obey the commandments. It's not about how Jesus makes it impossible for me to do these things. Because everybody lusts after the women. Everybody lusts after their, their favorite man. If anybody has a problem struggling with self-control, it's the guy who watches pornographic videos all day long, and that's probably 90% of the world, especially today. And it's not about, well, this is, this is the answer, come to me for forgiveness. He's saying, the answer is God in your presence. And the reason you can't see it and the reason you don't have self-control, it, it might be because God isn't there with you. You believe. You have faith. But you have yet to be baptized by the power of the Holy Spirit. is a spirit of empowerment, love, and self-control. That's the gift God gives you. He goes on to say it. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your eyes or the members of your body to be thrown into hell. Jesus is saying this is serious. You know, and that's something I, I've talked about with my friend and, uh, about free will. Does God give us free will? Do we have free will? Indeed, we do have free will. And God said, this is what you did with your free will. This is what you did with your free will. This is what you did when you were in the presence of God. And, and, and if you had known how destructive, how serious this is, you would have gouged out your eye. You would have done it. Because you would have rather to enter into the kingdom of heaven absent of body parts than to go into hell fully body. This is, this is how much you need God in your life. This is how serious it is. That if your hand causes you to sin, it'd be better for you to cut off that hand than to enter into hell fully body. Go into he heaven absent of body parts. You don't recognize or understand how serious it is. How serious it is to be separated from God forever. That's hell. It is being separated from God. We, we saw the man struggling with the demons. And what was that man? Living in a sense of torment. Because he was separated from God. What brought, what destroyed the torment? What brought the redemption? What brought the healing? God in his presence produced a sense of self-control. Again, 
verse 31, Matthew 5 says this. It was said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give him a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And again, you have heard it was said to that of old, you shall not swear falsely, but perform, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. And again, he's saying, you cannot display a sense of self-control without God in your presence. And that's what the, we're dealing with. That's what we're talking about comes from God in your presence and when God is in your presence and, and you have regained your ability to display a sense of self-control, that's when the foreign influence goes away. That's when we're able to engage in healthy, strong relationships. You know, we, we've got to put an end to the toxicity. And, and the toxicity comes from a lack of self-control. I don't have control over my emotions or my feelings and, and all these things and it usually comes from a lack of validation. I, I need you to validate me. My husband, my wife, my friends, my co-workers, my community, whatever it is. Because they refuse to do what I, what I so need for them to do, I'm full of frustration and anger. And, and you know what? always accepts me, the king of beers, mm -hmm. Bud Light, Bud Razor. He, but we're, we're, we're coming to the king of kings, Jesus Christ. He gives us control, and we have control. Then we can put an end to that foreign influence of that spirit that is truly breaking us down. And again, it doesn't matter what the addiction is. It's different for everyone, but everyone is suffering from some sort of addiction. We're not going to be able to overcome that addiction unless God is in our presence. Right? So we don't have to be cutting ourselves with rocks, walking around a graveyard. We are dead, and we are void of God's presence if there are any works to support our faith. The addiction is the slashing of the body. It's hurting us. It's breaking us down. Recovery is possible. I believe you can have it. Believe it is yours. Hope is alive. Our hope is alive in Jesus Christ, who strengthens us, who gives us the fruits of his good spirit, which restores within us a sense of gentleness, love, kindness, patience, self-control. That's why we come to church. Some people say, I don't, I'm not into all that religious stuff. We come to church because in coming to church, in the gathering of believers, what do we find? Jesus Christ. For wherever two or more gather in my name, that's where I am. That's why we come. To be in the presence of the living God. Let me end with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for all of your love and your grace that we find within your teachings and your instructions. We thank you, Father, for taking the time to be in our presence today. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with the fruits of your Spirit so that the world may look upon us and see that great light, praising your holy name, glorifying you. Because they see in us the glory of your invisible image. We love you, Jesus. We love you and we thank you. Come into our hearts and into our minds. 
filling our minds with wisdom, and our mouth with your word, and our heart with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Got a wonderful little song to listen to and uh, sit back and, and just enjoy it. I think that's a wonderful song and a great reminder that our God is with us. He is Emmanuel. And 
Even the angels of the Lord when they came to Mary and said, This will be your son. Your son's name will be Jesus. She didn't even give, get to give approval to the name nor choose the name. It was the name given to her. The name by which all men must come to God. We say men, mankind, must come to God through that name. And yet, that God is the God who is with us. He is our Emmanuel. That's why we got hope. So listen to medicine. Take that song so you guys would know I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> there, there's other people out there all singing and saying the same thing. It's God moving. And, and, you know, that's something we can come to God with is help. And we need help. It's okay to ask God for help. He will help you. In the same way James says, if you need wisdom, ask God for wisdom. And then expect Him to respond to answer. So if we need help in any of these things, in anything in life, in any aspect of life, ask and then believe God is going to give you what you need. And if you need help with self-control, ask and he will help you. That's the wonderful thing about having God in our life. One last song, and we'll go enjoy a wonderful lunch. I want to mention one thing to uh, Easter. We, we will have Easter services right here at our Father's House of Prayer, located at 4th and Birch here in Ray, Colorado. If you're out here in Ray or anywhere in Yuma County or anywhere in the neighboring areas and you'd like to come and worship with us Easter morning, we're trying to bring in people from all over 
from Denver and all around there, family, friends, and anyone who desires to worship with us Easter weekend, we will, after services for everyone who comes, we're providing breakfast. And uh, I think we're going to have biscuits and gravy, some sausage, bacon, eggs, and pancakes. You can have all or some of your choosing, whatever it is. And we're also going to do communion uh, that Sunday as well. So come on down, come on in, and be a part of that. Celebrate with us life, the life of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. One last song, and we'll get going. <laughs> 